Would you please begin by writing in your notes the declaration of all declarations. Jesus says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, and just so you know, Revelation, uh, though it is a book that chronicles the coming judgment, Revelation does not mean judgment book. What revelation means, it comes from the Greek word apocalypsis or apocalypse. Apocalypse or apocalypsis means unveiling. It's like if you go to see a sculptor who's made like a large marble sculpture and there's a large sheet on it and you're all waiting to see the art, you know, and then finally the, you know, the, the, the sheet is pulled away. It's an unveiling. It's an apocalypsis. That's what revelation is. It's the apocalypsis. It's the unveiling of Jesus Christ as the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, king of kings and lord of lords, the alpha and the omega, God God Almighty, fully God, fully man, the hypostatic union. And it's so august and so amazing that in Revelation chapter 1, when the apostle John, the only apostle who was not martyred, the only apostle to die of natural causes, well, tradition tells us that one of the Caesars tried to boil him in a vat of oil. And when he would not boil in the oil, but simply just had his arms raised in worship, the Caesar was too superstitious to try to do anything else to him. So he sent him to the prison chain gang island, which still exists today, the island of Patmos in Greece, where it was just a chain gang island. You were exiled to die there. It is when John is on the Isle of Patmos that Jesus Christ comes and reveals himself to him. Now, mind you, this is the same John who was so close to Jesus for three and a half years that at the last supper table, he actually reclines his head on Jesus's bosom. But yet, while knowing his Jesus, serving his Jesus for many decades at this point, when he sees Jesus in this glorified state in Revelation chapter 1, even he who had constant sleepovers with Jesus in the wilderness by the campfire, three and a half years, watched him rebuke the waves, watched him rebuke demons, watched him raise the dead, heal lepers, leaning his head on his bosom, when he sees Jesus in the apocalypse, the full glory of what we will one day see and be around forever, when we are singing before the throne and before the Lamb, when John sees Jesus in this way, he falls down like a dead man. Wow. And Jesus says, be not afraid. It is I. And then he makes this declaration in Revelation 1.18. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and I have the keys of death. What keys represent is authority. Christ came and conquered death. He is he who liveth and was dead, truly dead, but did not remain dead, was resurrected, and in resurrecting, conquered death. You see, many people in Scripture, going back even to the Old Testament and Elisha and Elijah, people were raised from the dead, but they would die again. Christ is the only one who would raise himself from the dead to be alive forevermore, conquered death, and now has the keys that represents authority over death. Why even the Psalms would say, the issues of life and death belong to the Lord. The Lord took death, which the Bible calls an enemy, which is a monster. That's why we don't like death. We don't like talking about death. You know, people knock on wood. People uh, don't want to walk under ladders. They wanna, don't want to break mirrors. It says the world is in bondage to a fear of death. And what Christ came and did is he conquered death and turned death into a slave. You see, the monster of death, or even the prophet Isaiah described death as having its jaws open and salivating to take a soul, Jesus would come and conquer death, so now death is just a servant. Death now 
is just a servant whose job is to usher you into the presence of Jesus in your glorified body where eye is not seen, ear is not heard, has never even entered the human. Imagine what God's prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2.9. Christ came and defeated death. He murdered death. We're talking about the death of death. He is risen. Because you see, even Sigmund Freud, the father of Western psychology, here's a quote of what he said. He said, and finally, there is the painful riddle of death for which no remedy at all has been found nor possibly ever will be. What would the, listen to that again. <clears throat> the father of Western psychology, Sigmund Freud. And finally, there is the painful riddle of death for which no remedy at all has been found nor possibly ever will be. Do you see that Christianity is the only worldview in a world of many worldviews where there's many so-called gods and so-called lords. Christianity is the only worldview that has an answer for death. And lets us know that death is conquered. And Jesus would not just conquer death, but he would actually raise and walk among and make appearances. And we're going to get into that for 40 days after his resurrection, showing that he wasn't a figment of anyone's imagination, wasn't a ghost, wasn't an apparition, allowed himself to be handled and ate meals with the disciples. And that actually is the very body of which we're going to have because Philippians says that he's the first fruits and when we see him, we will be as he is. If you want to know what kind of body you're going to have in heaven, will you be able to eat? Will you recognize loved ones? If you have those kind of questions, all your answers are found in looking at what Christ looked like and what Christ did for those 40 days after he was raised. He ate meals. He recognized those. Those recognized him. They could handle one another, hug one another. So someone and said, will we know one another in heaven? Well, the answer is we actually won't know one another until we get to heaven. Amen. You see, because in this world, we hide behind so many masks, so many walls are up. Uh, we have walls up that we don't even know how to take down ourselves. So yeah, uh, will we know one another in heaven? No, we actually won't know one another until we get to heaven, you know, and that's what we look forward to. So you guys, let me just begin by telling you, I'm proud of y'all. Because let me tell y'all, last week, we went through Daniel's 70-week prophecy. We had a whiteboard up here, and we looked at the greatest prophecy in the Old Testament where the prophet Daniel prophesied the very day that Christ would ride the donkey into Jerusalem. And we actually looked at when you start counting from, Daniel was told all the way in Babylon, when there's going to be a commandment to restore a wall and build a wall. Start counting there. And from there, continue to count, and it will lead you all the way up to the very day of the triumphal entry, which is why in Luke 19, when they don't recognize who Jesus is, Jesus begins weeping and says, if you'd only known this day. We did all the math on the board. I'm proud of y'all because we sat here for like 80 minutes, and you guys dug in. So I'm like, whoa, that's, I mean, yeah, yeah, you guys really did, you know? They said every church is either feeding sheep or entertaining goats. Either feeding sheep or entertaining goats. And you guys clearly showed that this is a church where sheep are eating, uh, not goats just wanting to be entertained. Amen? So I just had to say, like, yeah, y'all did that. You know what I mean? And as you remember, I was having you guys do the math on your smartphones just so it didn't even seem like, well, Pastor Aaron's just throwing so many numbers. What if, if I do it at home, will I get the same number? You guys were doing the math on your smartphones well, really, we need to give an applause to the Word of God. Amen. So, as you know, and let's go to Matthew chapter 27. As you know, our Lord was crucified. We, as a tradition, y'all, as a tradition, we observe the crucifixion on Good Friday. The reality is that Christ seems to have been crucified on a Thursday. Now, don't mean to make people look up and, whoa, do I walk out of here now? Well, one, we let the Bible, we look at everything in Scripture. Nowhere in the Bible do you see a Friday. In fact, what did Jesus say? That as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale of the fish, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the center of the earth, right? 
Now, if that's already hitting you like, whoa, I, I, I just don't know, it shows you also the power of tradition. Now, tradition's a good thing. And if you have been attending Good Friday services for 50 years, I'm 50 years old, there might be someone here that's been attending Good Friday services as long as I've been Goo Goo Gaga alive. That doesn't mean that you stop doing it. Just like December 25th, we know that's not the actual day Christ was born, but we observe it as a tradition. Christ was most likely born in the fall in commemoration with the Feast of Tabernacles. You look at that and look at when John the Baptist was born. We know that he was six months old older than Jesus, right? That's very clear in scripture, right? And then you see John the Baptist's birth according to when Zacharias was serving in the temple, according to the order of Abiah. Go back to Chronicles. David had set up an order. Priests just didn't decide who went and served. You did it according to your order. And Zacharias Zechariah was of the order of Abiah. So you could look at when the order of Abiah on a calendar when, just like if this side of the room cleaned the church uh, on January, this part February, that part March, and it was assigned seats every Sunday. If we did it for years, if we did it for decades, if we did it for a century, you could still see what month and who was serving and who was according to that. So when you look at all that, where am I going with this? Christ was most likely crucified on a Thursday because in order for it to be three days and three nights, it would have to be a Thursday. Now, you will find in the scriptures that it says that he was taken down before the Sabbath, right? Well, hey, I could look in the Gospels and it says that Christ's body was taken down because the Sabbath was coming. But you have to remember that in John, it's referring to the high Sabbath. Passover was considered the Sabbath. So I'm saying this only because some, in 23 years as a church, we have celebrated on Good Friday. Next year, we may do Good Friday. We're not, good, we're not haters of Good Friday. It's, it's about where the heart is, right? Whatever it is, right? Whether you call it Easter or Resurrection Day, it's about where the heart is. I mean, I know there's some churches, you might get in some trouble for saying Easter. But we understand it's tradition, right? We know it's not Easter. Easter comes from the Canaanite goddess Ishtar, right? Where it was the goddess of fertility and you associated the bunny with it because the bunny is the most fertile creature. So there is Easter and the Easter bunny. But when Constantine merged the Roman Empire and Christianity, they were forced, it was a forced conversion because remember he won a battle and believed that this in Latin, in signum wictus, in this sign conquer, because he won the battle, he's like, everyone's becoming Christian. So it was good and that persecution stopped but on the flip side, it was a forced conversion, so people brought all their other religions in, which is why in some churches today, you see such an amalgamation of things. You know, certain things, why are certain hats worn? Why are there sundials in certain churches? A lot of this goes back to Constantine. You might be sitting here like, whoa, really? All this before some fried fish and grits? I thought we were down to earth. <laughs> you, you serve down to earth food, but you're talking this stuff and babies are in here and I, I can't even write right now. I'm just holding babies, you know? I just share all of this to say that traditions are here. Traditions have their place. Even today, it's a tradition that we get really excited about the resurrection. But what the Bible teaches is that these things are to just be catalysts because the name of the game is for our hearts to always be in this place. You know, Christmas, let it be a catalyst so your heart is always blown away by the fact that God became a man, that the infinite became an infant, that the creator put on clay and was born of a virgin. For Resurrection Day, the tradition is that we get real revved up, you know, for this day, and then we go back to forgetting about the resurrection. No, let this day, let's use traditions to be a catalyst that Every day we're celebrating the resurrection. Do you know what the resurrection means most of all? There's one word. Like when I say peanut butter, you say what? When I say Tom, you say what? See? Ah, gen, gen, yeah, it's the Gen X church. <laughs> when I say Popeye, you say what? Olive oil. Oh, who said chicken? <laughs> We were on the cartoon vein. <laughs> Who's that chicken? <laughs> you got three kids, that's why, yeah. Wow, wow. But when I say resurrection, two words should come to mind. One, take a shot at it. When I say resurrection, when I say resurrection, according to the Bible, two things. When I say resurrection, deity, 
deity. Romans chapter 1 verse 4, he has shown that he is God by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection shows deity. No wonder in the book of Acts, every single message they preached, they mentioned the resurrection. When Paul was on Mars Hill engaging the Athenian philosophers, and I've had the pleasure of standing on the very Mars Hill where Paul engaged them, and whoa, just to learn that as amazing as the Acropolis is, actually it had this tall statue of Athena, the goddess of wisdom, all brass and bronze. So when the sun was setting, her mighty sword and body glowed like almost like the sun. He's standing under the glow of the goddess of wisdom before Athenian philosophers. And what does he do? He says, Christ is risen. He's going to a place. No one had Bibles. Kids had no VBS and there was no Awana. Okay. There was Athenian, Athenian Awana and Athenian uh, vacation school. And he goes and he declares a historical fact, resurrection. He's God. This is how it's not just what's good for me. It's not just what makes me feel good. It's not just for people, you know, don't worry, be happy. No, he has words to share. He has a message of salvation and he is God. And we know that by the resurrection. The other word that should come to mind when I say resurrection is, it would be King David's favorite word, if I had to guess, because he wrote in Psalm 32 verse 1, Happy beyond description. That's what it means, blessed. Happy beyond description. In fact, the word he's using in the Latin is beatus, blessed, beatus. The Romans said that beatus level of happiness was a happiness that only the gods could experience. And what does he say? Blessed, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. You see, the second word that should come to mind when I say resurrection is forgiveness. It says in Romans chapter 4 that he was delivered for our offenses and raised for what? Our justification. You see, the resurrection is God the Father saying amen to Jesus saying it is finished. You see, it is finished is actually Aramaic. It's tetelestai. What tetelestai means is paid in full, meaning that Christ came down, fulfilled all Old Testament scripture, gave sight to the blind, raised the lepers, cleansed the lepers, raised the, 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 the crippled, raised the dead, cast out demons. And then after fulfilling the law perfectly, he went to the cross as though he broke every point of the law. He took all of our F's, all of our D minuses, and by the way, that's all we had to the cross, even though he had nothing but straight A pluses. He swapped places with us. You see, the gospel is a story of the great exchange. It was a business swap. He came down to do the business of saving us, and the only way to save us would be to swap places with us and take the punishment that we deserve. He was delivered for our offenses when he was sinless. Even his enemies declared that. You see, Judas tried to return to 30 pieces of silver. I've betrayed innocent blood. Pilate would stand before the bloodthirsty mob. I find no fault at all in this man. Pilate's wife would say, do not do anything. I've had nightmares last night. Do not do anything to this just man. He was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification. For Christ to hang on the cross and say, it is finished, paid in full. Judgment day, don't worry about it. You should worry about it because it's the same Jesus that said, on judgment day, every idle word you've ever mentioned will be brought up. That means, you know what an idle word is? You might be like, well, I, well yeah, but yeah, I don't curse at people. I don't even curse. You, all right, you ever suck your teeth at somebody? You ever call somebody raka, a fool? Yeah, if you drive on, on the Schuylkill, you've called someone a fool. These fools, right? And you think that's still holy. Well, no, Jesus said, even if you call someone raka, you will give an account even for that. So the very one who said that on judgment day, even your idle words, even sucking your teeth at somebody, psh, you ever do that about somebody? Or what about this? Psh, this guy. <laughs> Yo, all of that waits in the eyes of a thrice holy God. But then what would he do? 
go to the cross and say, to tell us die, paid in full. Wow, that's a lot. How does the father feel about what he just said? We wait for three days. When the father raised him from the dead, that was the father's amen. That was the father saying to all of us, yes, I agree. Paid in full, amen. His blood is sufficient for sinners, rebels, nasty dudes and dudettes like us to be forgiven and to be spotless in his sight. Why? Because Revelation says nothing that defiles will be allowed in heaven. So if nothing that defiles is allowed in heaven, and if in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 22, God says, no matter how well you wash your body, no matter what oils or perfumes you put on, I still see the stench of your sin. If he says this, how can we get in? There is no amount of praying. It even says in Micah chapter 7, verse 18, uh, or Micah chapter 6, I believe, verse 7, you know, can I even give my own firstborn for my sin? What if I gave 10,000 bulls and 10,000 gallons of rivers of pure olive oil? Is there any way I can atone for my own sin? The answer is no. But he has shown you, Micah 6, 8, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And when it says in the scriptures, walking with your God, it's the assumption that you've received Christ as your Lord and Savior because two cannot walk together unless they're in agreement, Amos 3.3, and you have to be in agreement about what he says about sin, what he says about judgment, and what he says about the only way to receive forgiveness, which is his act of love in laying down his life to die for us. That is why he says, come and learn of me. That is why the Bible ends in Revelation 22 with an invitation, whoever's thirsty, whoever's thirsty, come and drink. Come and have and have the water of life freely. God the Father raising Jesus is the amen to Jesus saying, it is finished. Well, I wanted to walk you through Matthew 27, but I feel like if I do, Every baby in here is going to erupt like Mount, Mount St. Helens, you know? <laughs> so why don't we do this? I would encourage you just to read and reread the greatest love story ever told. I'll read some of it, and there's a couple of things I want to share, but let us just determine today that if we're putting anything in our place, anything in place, if we're studying anything more than we're studying the greatest love story of all time and what it means for us and giving him glory and thanks for it, that we have to call whatever that is idolatry. If there's anything, and, I, and look, I understand, you're like Pastor Aaron, you're talking to an entertainment-driven culture where we can watch Purdue, <laughs> we can watch great basketball, phenomenal basketball, actually, the best there is, actually, you know, or we can watch movies, we can watch anything, and you're saying that, and it's not what I'm saying. It is what the doctor, the great physicians prescribed because he knows the world we're in, and he also wants us to walk in what he calls a cup, an overflowing cup. You see, an overflowing cup is a cup of joy. It's a cup of happiness. It's a cup of peace. It's a cup, you know, of goodness. And we want to believe and fall in the trap of believing that the world's ways can give it to us because the actors and actresses on the stage of life are sending a message that it does exist in other places. But what the Bible makes clear is all of this comes from, all of this comes from the cross. All of love all of what we need, we, even if you fall in the trap and you're just looking for relaxation, even maybe looking for love in the wrong places, everything we need comes from the cross of Jesus Christ. And we have to determine, you know, even if we have to do it alone, if your friend group doesn't do it with you, we have to determine that we're going to set our hearts. Wouldn't the psalmist even write, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. What it means is not just, oh, I have 
a banner on my wall, and when I wake up in the morning, I see my favorite Bible verse. That's not what it means when it says, I've set the Lord before me. It means I have intentionally moved other things out of the way and set the Lord before me. I mean, let me ask you this. I mean, love, joy, peace. Aren't those, aren't those the, the, items, the, the items that everybody wants, right? I mean, people go in tremendous debt just to get away for some peace, right? And if anyone wants to give me a trip somewhere, I'll take it, you know? But isn't it great just to be reminded that all this comes from the cross? That the cross is not just the door we walk through, but it's the entire corridor. But you enter through the cross through the empty tomb. So I don't know if y'all remember this, but back in the 80s, follow this analogy. Before there were a motorized, you know, side mirrors on your car, you got side mirrors on your car, yes? Before there were side mirrors on your car, come on, y'all holler at me, my Gen Xers, you had two windows in your car. You had the window here that came straight down that you rolled down like this, yeah? yeah? And you could, I mean, right? Some of you had skills. You got that window down and up fast. But then there was this little triangle window that was right in the front, and you pulled a latch, and you could stick it out. And that's the latch that you would use to reach through and fix the mirror for mom or dad or uncle or grandma while they're driving, yes? If you understand, how many of y'all remember that mirror? How many of y'all need to Google that mirror? See, y'all don't know. Y'all talking about, oh, I got to reach all the way over there for the button to lower the window. No, what about this? And then what did you do when you went in a car and the knob was off and you had to get that window down? You know what I mean? And it was hot. And leather back then burned you. That pleather would set you on fire on a summer day. And there was no AC. Anyway, uh, (laughs) then we go to Action Park, which is the most dangerous place on the planet. But anyway, in the same way, you guys, we have to reach through the empty tomb to appreciate the cross of Christ. Because a lot of people were put on crosses, okay? There may have even been someone named Joshua put on a cross, But only one made the claim that you had nothing to worry about on Judgment Day, that he had the power to forgive sins. Only one came and said that he was God. Do you realize in every worldview, our worldview is the only worldview where our leader said he was God? Muhammad never did. Confucius, Buddha, right? Gautama the Buddha. Jesus is the only one that came down and said, I'm God. Do you understand? The world has to investigate that. Because he's either a liar, very malicious and evil. He's either a lunatic, a megalomaniac. He doesn't mean no harm. He's just psychologically deranged and thinks he's a Messiah and he's not. Or he is Lord. He's either Lord, liar, or lunatic. He's one of the three, but every one of us must discover and see which one. What I'm saying is we must look at the cross as it being the instrument through which God hung on the tree himself to show us his love so that we can have his forgiveness and that he rose from the dead, giving us our surety of forgiveness. How many of you have made Christ your Lord and Savior? You don't have to raise hands, but you've made Christ your Lord and Savior. Do you celebrate his forgiveness? All sins paid for, past, present, and future. So I was like, oh, don't teach that too much, pastor. You'll produce lasciviousness. People will just go out and do whatever they want to do. No, the Bible says you do preach that because what it produces is a gratitude. And love will drive you to serve and do more than a fear or any other motivation. Christ conquers us with his love. Yes, he does. Yes. So if you look at Matthew 27... It tells us in Matthew 27, verse 1, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. When they bound him, they led him away. They delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, he repented himself, brought the 30 pieces of silver back, and he said, I've sinned. I betrayed innocent blood. Well, they said, well, what is that to us? You worry about that. So he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple, and he departed and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces, and they said, it's not lawful to put this back in the treasury because it's the price of blood. 
So they took counsel and they bought with that a potter's field to bury strangers in, and therefore that field is called the field of blood. In verse 9, it was fulfilled that was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. And Jeremiah had prophesied that they would take the money that was used to betray Jesus and that they would buy a potter's field with it. Did you know that Jeremiah had prophesied that? Do you know that when Jesus came, he fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies in his first coming alone? I believe it's called Emil Borel. Is Emil Borel, is that her name? The one that has taught us logic and brought logic and talks about the law of probability. If something is greater than 1 times 10 to the 50th power, It means that it can never happen. It is an impossibility of happening by coincidence. Christ fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies. Do you know a university in a statistics class in Texas actually looked at what would be the statistics, what would be the odds of some random person just coincidentally fulfilling just a couple of handful of those prophecies? Do you know what they found that it was? One times 10 to the 187th power. And Emil Borel in Borel's law says that anything greater than one times 10 to the 50th is an impossibility. Jesus Christ came and fulfilled all prophecy. He is God of very God. He is the promised one all the way from the Garden of Eden. He is our friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is the apocalypse, the unveiling. He is the one who will never leave us or forsake us. And he is the one who holds our hand and is growing us daily. And that one day we will see and worship before the throne. He is the risen one. And in a world that is wowing us with so much that is just wow, we have to make sure that we keep the wow in the resurrection, that we keep the wow in who Jesus is. Because let's admit, yo, there's stuff out there to make you say, wow, you'll leave here and you will go in a grocery store. It'll be something free on a toothpick. You can't even pronounce where it came from. Some smoked something from somewhere, and you eat it, what do you say? Wow. Why do we all get more excited about the commercials than we do about the Super Bowl itself? And what do you say after a really good commercial in the Super Bowl? Wow. Yo, we're in a day where I think the wow level, if there was a wow meter, I think the wow meter is higher now than perhaps it's ever been in human history. Even though the Greeks and Romans... If you visited the Colosseum, did you know that they could make the Colosseum actually fill up with water? And that they actually could reenact war scenes and have ships brought in and you'd be in the Colosseum. They had a water system. Water would come up and actually it would look like and they would reenact ocean battles in boats. Yeah, wow. So believe me, it's always been a wow factor. But our job is to make sure that we're keeping the wow in the resurrection, the wow, in Jesus as the one who fulfilled scripture. Did you know that Zechariah eleven twelve also prophesied he'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver? Zechariah 9, 9 prophesied that he would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Micah 5, 2 prophesied that he would be born in Bethlehem. Isaiah 53 prophesied that he would be born in poverty. Isaiah 35, verse 5 and 6 prophesied that he would perform many miracles. Isaiah 11 prophesied that he would be called out of Egypt as a child, Right? It goes on and on. He would be called a Nazarene. Psalm 22 prophesied that he would be crucified when crucifixion was not even invented yet as a capital punishment. Isaiah 53 prophesied he'd be crucified between transgressors. Isaiah 53 prophesied he'd be buried in a rich man's tomb. And it goes on and on and on. You see, he's Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. So when we call Jesus God... (laughs) Lord, King of Kings, it's not just the cultural thing to do here, and it's not just our message, it's the message for the world. You know what, I think I better just read this to you and get out of your way. In John chapter 18, why don't you turn there? In John 18, Pilate begins realizing that this is more than a man. He has Jesus flogged and scourged where they would actually undress you. And it was designed to get a confession out of you. Because remember, Isaiah also prophesied that just as a sheep does not speak before its shearers, Jesus would not speak when he was in, when being judged. So they would ask Jesus questions and fulfill in the scripture, he would not answer them. So Pilate orders him to be scourged. When you were scourged, it was when you were undressed down to the waist, 
Your body was bent over a large log or a stone pillar, and the Romans would take lashes. Some say it was the 40 lashes. Some say it was nine. But the lashes were long, and they were embedded with metal balls and with bits of bone. The metal balls were designed to cause all internal bleeding, and the bones were designed to hook flesh and rip. And they would actually whip you with it till it wrapped around your body. And then that bloodthirsty Roman soldier would take his sandal, put it on your hip, and then pull it off the same as when you're pulling a lawnmower. When Christ was scourged, he said not a word. And you want to know why? Because if he did speak, he would have had to confess. And you know what he would have had to confess? Not his own sin. He would have had to confess my sin. He would have had to say your name. He would have had to say who deserved the punishment. But he says nothing. After he scourged, Pilate says, Echi homo, behold the man. Most people died from that. Your internal organs were exposed at that point. Didn't, wasn't it prophesied in Isaiah 52 that the Messiah, when he came, would not just suffer, but he would be beaten beyond human recognition that no one could recognize him and that his beard would be ripped out? Pilate sees him still standing with all of this, his body undergoing hypovolemic shock, the pericardium of his heart now filling with water, right? That's why when the Roman soldier would drive the spear up through his side, blood and water would come out, showing one, that he was truly dead, two, that he had major congestive and pulmonary failure because there was fluid and water all around that region. Pilate sees this as more than a man. So he takes Jesus in the back, and he asks Jesus this question, and he asks Jesus, are you truly who they say you are? And you'll see that in John 18. Let's just read this real quickly. I'm going to read a quick point and then we'll be done. Let's look at John chapter 18 and let's look at verse 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, this is before the crucifixion, and said, do you say this thing on your own, or did someone tell you this? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered and said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight that I should not be delivered. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. You said it, and to this end was I born. For this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Then look at what Pilate says. This is relativism. Pilate says, what is truth? And when he said this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no fault in this man. You see, it's not just realizing that Jesus is great that gets you saved. It's not just saying, oh yes, there's no fault in Jesus. He never did nothing wrong. It's not those mere confessions that get you saved. It's actually receiving Christ as the only way to the Father. He said, there's no other way. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is what Jesus would say. Now, if he went to the cross, died, and never rose, you could take everything he ever said and throw it out. Because he said on the third day he would be raised from the dead. But because he is risen, the whole world must hear ye him. And even if you've grown up hearing ye him, but you've been gone and MIA, and like the prodigal, you've been out in Babylon doing your thing, it says that he's married to the backslider. It's still always the perfect day to come back. And come back, everyone must, and hear ye him. Pilate said to him, though, what is truth? Meaning, it might be true for you, but it's not true for me. Can I give you guys eight points about truth? Would you like that? Would you write in your notes the truth about truth? And let's take five minutes. The truth about truth. In a world that says Christianity is narrow-minded and bigoted, right? Let's look at, what is the, let's look at the truth about truth. Because Pilate said, hey, Jesus, it might be true to you and your followers, but it's not true to me. Your truth might not be my truth. My truth might not be your truth. What is truth? He was speaking relativism. It's true to you. Something else is true to me. And he walks out, right? Well, in a world, and especially a day like today where so many want to take that road, are we allowed to do that in the face of truth? 
Are we allowed to do that? Write in your notes the truth about truth. Write this, point one, all truth claims are absolute, narrow, and exclusive. Every truth claim is absolute, narrow, and exclusive. Not just Christianity, every truth claim. Saying two plus two is four is absolute, narrow, and exclusive. You mean it can't be 4.1, 4.2, can't be 4.4, can't be 4.9, can't be 3.999999 with a repeating bar? No, it can only be four. That's narrow. All truth claims are narrow. All truth claims are exclusive, right? When you say Christ is the only way, that's narrow. But guess what? When you say pluralism is fine, that's also narrow. Because what you're saying is saying Christ is the only way is not allowed. That's narrow and exclusive, right? All truth claims are narrow, absolute, and exclusive. Let's look at point two. Truth is always discovered. It's never invented. Newton did not invent gravity. He discovered it. Aristotle did not invent logic. He discovered it. Truth claims are discovered, not invented. Truth was here before anyone discovered it. Math, the principles of physics, they were discovered, not invented. Truth claims are not invented. They're discovered. Point three. Belief cannot change a fact no matter how sincerely it's held. Belief cannot change a fact no matter how sincerely it is held. A vast number of people out there believe as long as you're sincere in what you believe, you're going to make it to heaven. But despite how much you believe something, it does not change a fact. Despite you could believe two plus two is five all you want. No matter how much you believe it, it does not change a fact. Four, truth transcends culture. Truth transcends culture. Two plus two equals four in Moscow. Two plus two equals four in Peking. Two plus two equals four on Mars. Truth transcends culture. Some philosophers emerge saying that truths are culturally relative. Uh, and even the laws of logic are culturally relative. But, but all truth claims, they transcend culture. Point five, being raised in a different culture doesn't make their belief true. Being raised in a, in a different culture does not make their beliefs true. So it is true. Most people in a Buddhist nation grew up to be Buddhists. Most people in uh, an Islamic nation grew up to be Islamic. But being raised in a different culture does not make their beliefs true. You know who tried that? Actually, Adolf Eichmann tried to use that in the famous Nuremberg trials. You know who Adolf Eichmann was? That was Hitler's executioner. He killed 12 million people, 6 million Jews, 6 million non-Jews. And in the famous Nuremberg trials, he said, I'm Nazi because I was raised in a Nazi environment. This is my truth because of my culture. And it was determined, no, truth transcends culture. Just the fact you were raised in Nazism does not make your belief and what you were taught true. And he was found guilty nonetheless. So being raised in a racist culture doesn't make racism true. Being raised in Nazism doesn't make Nazism true. Being raised in a different culture doesn't make their belief true. Point six, a bad attitude about truth doesn't make it error. A bad attitude about truth. So if you meet a Christian and they claim to follow Christ and they are acting like a child of the devil, that does not make uh, the truth an error. Just like if you meet a super loving atheist who literally lays down their life for you, that does not make atheism true. You see that? So a bad attitude about truth does not make it uh, an error. Seven, objective truth cannot be denied. Because if you actually deny it, you're actually affirming it. So when you say there's no absolute statements, everything is relative, you actually contradicted yourself because that's an objective statement. Right? right? And it's interesting because you actually have people in the highest level of education actually breaking that uh, principle of logic daily, right? It's self-defeating. And then point eight, contrary beliefs are possible, but contrary truths are not possible. Contrary beliefs are possible, but contrary truths are not possible. 
So it's interesting. We believe in absolute truth when it comes to our safety, our money, medicine, relationships, and our court proceedings. That's why at court, they don't say, do you swear to tell the relative, the whole relative and nothing but the relative? No, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, objective truth? Christ would come and say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I offer forgiveness. Now come and bow and let's give us our honor to the Lord. So let's have the worship team come up now at this point. Let's worship our Lord, the risen one. I encourage you to read Acts chapter 15, making clear. And you know what? Just pull out your notes. One, one last point, and I promise it'll be done in 60 seconds. Are you ready? Watch. F-E-A-T. The resurrection of Christ is a feat. F, fatal torment. The spear in the side showed he actually died. Islam tries to teach that he swooned on the cross and was resuscitated later. No, F, fatal torment. Those assassins knew how to kill a man, and when blood and water came out, fatal. He truly died. Fatal torment. E, empty tomb. And he even used women to be the first one to see it, knowing that women weren't even allowed to testify in court in those days. Empty tomb for the world to see. A, appearances, appeared to over 500 people after his resurrection. And then T, transformed lives. Anemic believers who ran when he got arrested are now suddenly being willing to be killed, skinned alive, crucified upside down, or thrown from the top of the temple to plummet 100 yards below. Something changed in them. They saw the Christ transformed. My brothers and sisters, if you've received Christ, something's changed in you. Let's continue to walk in that transformation because it says we're a peculiar people to show forth the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let's walk away with this today. Let's be sure to walk as transformed people unless it says like in the Bible, you make the mistake of going back to your old lusts in your ignorance. F-E-A-T, fatal torment, empty tomb, appearances, transformed lives. Let's walk as transformed people. God bless you. If you don't know the Lord, please, before you leave today, we will lead you in a beautiful prayer to pray and receive him into your heart. Let's worship. We'll also receive an offering for our Lord. And as I share, this is not the credits to the movie. This is actually when we get to worship God with our giving so that we could take this message and this love to a Christ less dark world that is hurting and needs his love. So Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for your word. We pray you'd receive this offering as a gift. We want to give it to you with worship. May you use it to touch lives, to touch multitudes. We also pray you'd receive this food today. I mean that you would bless the food. And we thank you for this day. And we celebrate your risen. And we love you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you guys.